The Ideas Exchange, in association with HSBC. Business titans are shaping the modern world. They've revolutionized our lives with technological innovation. They forge new relationships between entire continents. Their decisions affect what we do, how we work, where we live. How are you? In the Ideas Exchange, top executives travel the world to question one another. They come head to head to reveal the challenges they face and how each of them has achieved success. It's not a good sign if a company is dependent on the CEO. Germany, the home and workplace of Innes Kolmsey. Innes is the only female CEO of a German publicly listed indexed company. She has broken through what many regarded as a glass ceiling for German women in top management. Her company, SKW Metallurgy, makes chemicals for the world's steel industry. And it's a true global enterprise, with production plants in Russia, America, China, Europe and Brazil. But Innes runs it with a small team of fewer than 30 people, based in and around these offices in central Munich. Innes is a globetrotting CEO, a wife and mother of four children, who trained originally as an engineer. I understand technology and that helps me tremendously in, in, in my current job talking to engineers. I, I mostly talk to engineers, actually. Innes came into SKW in 2004, tasked with taking the company to be publicly listed with an initial public offering. She achieved the IPO in 2006. She was due then to leave, but chose to stay and has run the company ever since. Under her stewardship, SKW has expanded both its plant ownership and production worldwide. Innes is travelling halfway across the world to open SKW's newest manufacturing plant at Technosulfur, based in Belo Horizonte, an hour's flight from Sao Paulo. But before that, she is going to meet and talk to one of Brazil's most important and influential businessmen. I'm very interested in meeting this, uh, this gentleman because um, I already spoke to my Brazilian managers and they all are very impressed by Embra as a company because it's one of the largest, really international companies that Brazil has. Sao Paulo, Brazil. The home and workplace of Frederico Corrado. Frederico, or Fred as he is known to all, is the CEO of Embraer, the world's third largest manufacturer of commercial jets after Boeing and Airbus. Using advanced digital techniques, Embraer designs and manufactures the majority of its planes here in Brazil and delivers its exclusively short-haul aircraft to Azul, the internal Brazilian airline, and other major airlines around the world. Fred has become a leading spokesman for Brazilian business. After graduating in aeronautical engineering, he has worked for Embraer ever since, rising up through the ranks to become its CEO. I started my career as engineer level 1A. So <laughs> it was absolutely the first step <laughs> in the ladder. So I really know the company from the inside. But like SKW, it has small management offices in downtown Sao Paulo, with one of its main manufacturing plants at a nearby airport. It is one of the only true large Brazilian corporations. I don't see Embraer not being Brazilian. I see it's a global company headquartered in Brazil. Our heart and soul, they are here. And I think they should stay here. It's part of our DNA. Innes is meeting Fred at the Embraer offices, and both are excited at the prospect of talking to each other. I'm very curious. She's certainly a, a brave person, a brave woman. 
having achieved what she has. So uh, look forward to that. Hi, welcome. Hello. How are you? Very nice to meet you. Nice How to are meet you? you. Welcome to Brazil. Thank you. They know each other by reputation only, but are keen to sit down and discuss their different approaches to their businesses. And Innes has her questions at the ready. What were the qualities that made you successful here? The company is a successful story, mm -hmm. and I'm part of the company. I've been with the company for a long time. And uh, I think like any other success story, any other successful company, it's a combination of things. You know, it's an investment in the, in the right technologies, uh, really taking a longer term uh, perspective, not something just for the opportunistic perspective, right people of course, so uh, I don't think there is a secret, like a formula that we mm -hmm. say. Embraer specializes in commercial aircraft with up to 120 seats. They've got more than 65 clients in 40 countries. The company was set up by the Brazilian government over 40 years ago, initially to make planes for its military. Embraer was founded in 1969 with a clear vision that uh, first could not be just military, had to be civilian, and second, had to address the international market, which was at that time a crazy dream. And why Embraer survived and, uh, and prospered? Because it's based on, on a foundation of knowledge. Brazil has very good aeronautical engineering schools, which provide a very high level of individuals that had a full understanding of aerospace disciplines. And from those beginnings, Embraer grew and moved into the commercial market, producing turboprop and jet planes. It was privatized in 1994. It also now manufactures business jets. In all, its turnover is in the region of $6 billion a year. But plane making is a tough business and it is fiercely competitive. How do you manage to be competitive producing solely in Brazil and exporting? Brazil had, uh, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, a huge investment in an uh, industrial base and we achieved actually a very broad and diversified industrial base. And unfortunately we lost a lot of that over the last, uh, say, 20 years. We became uh, now almost like an island of excellence in Brazil and the foundation of our company is, is knowledge. We really understand aeronautic uh, disciplines and aeronautic science and technology. And we never lost perspective of that we need to be a global player, we need to be an exporter, we need to really get into foreign markets to survive. So we always had this international perspective that certainly helped us through the decades that we have lived. The majority of Embraer's airplane production is in its six Brazilian plants. It has a number of other manufacturing facilities around the globe. Most produce spare parts, but only the ones in the USA and China produce complete planes. It is still very much a Brazilian operation. What makes us equal to larger players such as Boeing and Airbus is that uh, we, we have the ability to talk to a customer, understand their requirements, conceive an airplane, develop, certify it, produce, produce it and support it in uh, over 30 years of operation. The airplane is fundamentally a very light structure stuffed with several competing systems, competing mm -hmm. for space, competing sometimes for electromagnetic interference. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a, it's a very complex exercise of combining several complex systems. For Embraer, investment in developing new aeroplanes is vital to the future of its business. Nearly half a billion dollars is set aside each year for research and development alone. There are two cycles which are important for us to understand. One is the product development cycle, which is a typical six, seven, eight years deal. That is tricky because you have to anticipate requirements many, many years before you see any revenue coming from that investment. So it's, it's a very tricky cycle. And the other one is the recurring cycle, the production cycle, which is not seven, eight years, about uh, you know, 12 to 18 months, depending, although we build an aircraft in just a few weeks, but the supply chain requires us to put orders for, for example, uh, engines and other long-time items, sometimes 12, sometimes 15 months in advance. So uh, this is also tricky because, you know, what you do not want is to have white tails. White tails is an airplane unpainted, which means it does not have a customer when it's finished. 
So basically, your employees need to be extremely internationally minded in order to be able to have that interface with uh, international suppliers. When we develop a new airplane, for the last probably 10, 12 years, our process developing, uh, we call mm -hmm. it the integ integrated product development, we actually bring everybody physically together. Mm -hmm. Here so, in Brazil. Here in Brazil, at our engineering center. So mm -hmm. we have, for example, you know, uh, six or 700 people from our major suppliers mm -hmm. under a single roof, sharing one single database, which they can actually see and, and, and touch and interact mm -hmm in real time, we call it the integrated development team. Yeah. And for the first, let's say, 12 months of any project, we do that. We have virtual reality centers that can actually visualize those things in real time and change whatever they have to change uh, right there. So they share the same database. Fred has been all his working life at Embraer, and he remains committed and passionate about the company. The company is, is actually bigger than, than ourselves. So there's over 17,000 families, and this responsibility has to be carried over, has to be perpetual. It just keeps growing, hopefully. Much as Fred feels Embraer has its DNA in Brazil, nevertheless, he has big plans for expansion. We are moving from a large exporter based in Brazil to hopefully a large global company based in Brazil, and to be global, because your company is more global than, than my company, actually. So you're essentially global. So we are becoming global. So you're mm -hmm. still very concentrated in Brazil. But uh, as, as time goes by, as we grow, uh, I see Embraer really having industrial footprints in other places. But so far, Brazil, US, and China. That's where we have industrial operations. Mm -hmm. As a business person, if you had the chance to change one thing in Brazil, what would you change? Just one? Just one. <laughs> Can I change more? <laughs> I have a very optimistic view because, you know, when I compare Brazil to many other countries, I think we are ahead already. I think in a good track. But uh, this overall, let's say, difficulty, bureaucracy, is a burden to business in the country still. But what does Fred think lies at the base of Embraer's lasting business success? You have to have your long-term vision and stick to the planning. So, so far, we, I think we have made the right calls. And we had to make that sort of decision a few times over the last, uh, actually, always, <laughs> since, since the first day of the company. Embraer's heart and soul may be based in Brazil, but the company knows it has to look outwards and take into account the fluctuating business fortunes of the rest of the world. Uh, coming to Europe, you're probably hit by the Euro crisis to a certain extent. What do you think of that being, being a bit farther away from that. I think Europe is still a, a, a hub for the world. I think the European unity mentality, you know, politics, uh, economy, monetary policy, will tend to be more unified in detriment of some nationalistic uh, movements. And that's going to be good for, for, the, for the continent. But I think you are too much down the road to let it collapse right now. How important is Europe for you? Europe is not that important. It represents about 30% of our sales right now. Mm -hmm. And margin-wise, it has always tracked behind uh, the Americas. Yeah, mm -hmm. So the fact that it's slowing down now it doesn't hurt us that much. Fred himself is modest, even though he is leading a company with a $6 billion turnover. I think what is unique about Embraer, not me, is a little bit about David and Goliath. I mean, we have huge companies in Brazil. We have you know, Petrobras, we have Vale, and uh, companies which are you know, more important for, for the country than we are. And here we are. I think we earned our space. And there's one more thing that Innes is keen to know. And one last question. You're probably flying your own planes as well. Uh, what is your favorite plane? I love the Lega 650. It's a private jet that we manufacture. Mm -hmm. So when I have the chance to fly a private jet, which I, I only use when it's absolutely necessary. Mm. I fly Lega 650, it's a wonderful aircraft. You should buy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have the money for that. Thank you. Thank you. Ines Kolmzi is one of Germany's leading businesswomen. Now in her early 40s, she is the CEO of SKW Metallurgy, an international chemical company that provides the vital ingredients in sophisticated steel production. Innes has traveled to Brazil to open a new SKW-owned plant at Tecnosofar and to meet the CEO of Embraer, Frederico Corrado. We 
we've heard his philosophy of business and the building of his sophisticated jet planes, and now he is keen to find out more about Innes's own business thoughts and about what he considers her truly global company. Running such a global business must be very challenging on, on you personally, especially being a working mom as you are with four children. How do you manage? I think um, being successful on a global level, you need to enjoy it. I really enjoy working internationally. I would feel very limited if I had to work only in Germany. I really enjoy meeting people from other countries, understanding the business environment in other, other countries. I really take a lot of energy from both sides of my life. I take a lot of energy from my job because I enjoy it, but I also take a lot of energy from my kids because they're wonderful and they're very different, obviously, from what I do in my business life. The rise of a woman to be a CEO in Germany was not an easy road for Ines, who was under social and cultural pressure. The German family model has always been very much based on the woman staying at home and husband um, earning the money. And uh, in, like in the 70s and, and even in the 80s, it was like a husband was proud that his wife didn't have to work, uh, independent of children or not. And uh, this attitude is only slowly changing. But for Ines, her own family was the model for her life journey. Ines, how did your family background, education, shape today's uh, Ines? Actually, my mom um, always worked. She already worked when, when I was born and she never stopped working. For me, it was always clear I wanted a career and I didn't want to stop working when I, when I would have children. So that's my mom's side and my father, he's an engineer. So he actually interested me in technology and science and initially I wanted to um, be a physics major and uh, wanted to win the Nobel Prize. Then I realized that would not work out, <laughs> so I changed career, uh, career plans. Um, but that's the two sides. How do these two uh, entrepreneurial side and engineering technical side integrate into the successful uh, CEO that you are now? I think the entrepreneurial side is extremely important uh, running a company. The biggest compliment that someone can give me is to say you run the company as if it was yours, as if it was your money and not shareholders' money. That's how I do it and my, my husband is actually an entrepreneur. So when we discuss at dinner table, we have the same questions. Ines heads a company that produces chemicals, a dirty and sometimes ugly process. But she has her own inimitable way of describing what SKW actually makes. Our products are chemicals for the steel industry. 90% of our sales go to the global steel industry. And the chemicals, they intervene in the liquid phase of steel making, first in the desulfurization of the hot metal and then in what we call the secondary metallurgy part. Someone once compared steel making to cake baking. Yeah, so you add big amounts of, 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 of like flour and, and, and eggs and milk. Yeah, that would be iron ore and coke. Yeah, and then you put flavor to it to make that cake like a chocolate cake or um, like a cinnamon roll or whatever. And we're the spices, actually. So we're, we're the cinnamon yeah, to make that particular cake steel special. So whatever defines the steel grade comes also from our products. SKW was originally a privately owned enterprise, but it was in trouble when Innes took over in 2004, with the instruction to take it into public ownership with a share offering. You conducted the IPO mm -hmm. of the company some years ago. Can you share uh, about that experience? That was one of the biggest experiences in my life, because it's, it's like a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be able to take a company, company public and especially since uh, when I took over as a CEO the company was a restructuring case and I was I managed together with my team to turn the company around in about one and a half years mm -hmm. and then basically the culmination of that success was the IPO and uh, it's, it's a very special experience because there's so many new words and terms and you talk to the bankers and uh, we did a lot of the, the work ourselves because we were stingy. We really plunged into that experience. And when, when we uh, succeeded in, in having a good share price and, and being able to place all the shares that we wanted to place, it was, it was a great success for us. SKW now has plants all over the world, from Russia to Mexico, from Brazil and the USA to France and Scandinavia. 
and Innes makes it her personal business to travel constantly to oversee their operations. I think it's important to be on site, to talk to the people. It's also a cultural thing. With Americans, managing them works very well over the phone. Not at all in, in countries like Brazil, where you need a more personal touch, and uh, not at all in, in, in Asia, especially in India and Bhutan. Uh, you need also a personal uh, connection, because on the phone they will tell you yes, yes, and then nothing will happen, so you really need to be on site. But any global company cannot afford to stand still and must look to new opportunities and business frontiers. Any particular region where you, you, you think about focusing your future investments, how do you see this playing out in the future? The big black box for us is actually China, because the business practices that we see in China in our markets just don't work for us. Mm -hmm. yeah, we have very strict uh, code of conduct rules and we want to have a margin and those two things don't work together in China in our business currently. Yeah, so once we see that changing, that's definitely a market that we'll tackle. For such a global enterprise, the actual management team that drives SKW from Germany is a very small proportion of their total workforce. Is it 98% of your workforce which is outside Germany? That's true. So you, you hire locally, and, uh, and what's the secret? Because I'm sure that to be successful, you, you have good people. HR is the CEO's job. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so um, every person that starts working for us in Germany is interviewed by me also. So it's the most noble of their jobs, so true, to say. True. And uh, so, for example, in Germany, every person that starts there, I do interview them. And um, also, obviously, the, the people that are running our countries, I'm interviewing them, but also the level below that, I'm also seeing them. Yeah, and uh, what I also like to do, but that's not the attracting talent part so much, but the nurturing talent part, I really like to put people in tandems. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, usually tandems that are a younger person and an older person, a more experienced person. And uh, that works very well. Because like like a have, tutor. Almost, yeah. yeah, but it's, it goes both ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the younger person brings in uh, new the knowledge, um, especially new technology knowledge mm -hmm. um, and energy, and uh, the more experienced person brings in the experience. SKW's management, young and old, are on display at the opening of their new Brazilian plant, which Ines, as the honored guest and CEO, is about to declare operational. It is a big investment, but it's backed by committed entrepreneurial instinct. I like to run a more decentralized organization. I like to have entrepreneurial people in my local companies. And they like it. They like the freedom um, I'm giving them. And uh, they deliver the results to, to have the match between that decentralized style and, and the control that is still needed. You seem to me to be a very demanding CEO and very hands-on CEO. If I, were, if I were to ask your team, your direct reports, what would they tell me? I think they would say I'm tough, yes, mm -hmm. but always fair. And uh, sometimes, and that's, that's the biggest reproach, they say they don't know what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah? But I think it's, it's not always necessary that they need to know what I'm thinking. So <laughs> I will not change that. <laughs> One final question. You're very young. You're already very successful. You opened the capital of a company. You have, you're running a global business. What's next? I really want to make the company independent of myself more than it is today. Mm -hmm. um, because I think uh, it's not a good sign if a company is dependent on the CEO. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for the interview. Thank you. After their conversation, Fred had presents for Ines that unsurprisingly included an airplane but they also took the time to both reflect on their feelings about the encounter. Well, I learned that uh, you, can, you can run a global company uh, in Germany not having many German uh, employees. This is absolutely rare, maybe unique. That was interesting. I particularly like the integrated engineering part that he described in his development process. I think that's a very good idea because that's something I see a lot in development. The interfaces are always the problem. That they have the courage to really put so many people under one roof for such a long time, I think is part of their success. Very nice. Thank you. Clearly a people's person. 
She clearly is very focused, very good understanding about shareholders' value and the, the role of a CEO. She's a winner. All that now remains is for Innes to open her new plant, which is one of the few factories in the world that makes sintered synthetic slag. The Ideas Exchange, in association with HSBC.